Present you is burnt out at your current job. But future you works at Geico. And future you is also a beekeeper. Me? I don't even go outside. Well, with Geico, you got a consistent schedule. So you are now one with nature, my friend. So I've become a bee person? Technically an apiarist. And yes, you also got a competitive salary, so you had the funds to start a new hobby. All right. Give me that honey. <laughs> Virginia Beach. Start your future at Geico. We're hiring claim sales and service agents. Apply online today at geico.job slash Virginia Beach. The Peel Art Gallery, Museum, and Archives, also known as PAMA, is pleased to partner with Caribbean Art Fair, Black Artist Network and Dialogue, and guest curators Karen Carter and Craig Manuel to present When Night Stirred at Sea, Contemporary Caribbean Art. This exhibit aims to connect Caribbean artists to the broader art world and includes local and international talent, including Brampton's own Janice Reed. The exhibit begins on October 29th virtually and eventually on site once PAMA reopens to the public. For more information, please visit pama.peelregion.ca. You are listening to New Theory Radio. Welcome to New Theory Radio on Saga 960 AM, the show where we theorize on arts and pop culture. My name is Nav Nanwa and I am your host. New Theory Radio is presented by PAMA, the Peel Art Gallery, Museum, and Archives. We're continuing our coverage of PAMA's One Night Stirred at Sea. The exhibit is in partnership with Caribbean Art Bear, the Black Artist Network and Dialogue, as well as guest curators Karen Carter and Greg Manuel. It brings together works by several English Caribbean artists to reflect on the breadth of contemporary aesthetic practices within the broader Caribbean community. The first virtual artist talk takes place this Saturday, November 28th, where the exhibit will be profiling photographers. These artists will take time to explain their individual practices and influences and will discuss the ways in which their imagery is influenced and speaks to their connections to the Caribbean, the history of the place, as well as ideas and the construction around identity. Joining me to talk about the exhibit uh, in more detail, as well as the upcoming talk, I have uh, one of the curators, Greg Manuel, as well as two artists that will be participating with the talk. The first is a filmmaker and visual artist from Negril, Jamaica, on a mission to create universal stories wrapped in complex social and cultural dynamics of the Caribbean. His award-winning debut film, Better Must Come, was hailed by critics as signaling a fresh new movement of independent filmmaking throughout the Caribbean. He's worked with the likes of local uh, awesome band Arcade Fire, as well as uh, Jay-Z and Beyonce, just to name a few. And his award-winning second feature, Sprinter, which, mind you, is executive produced by Jada and Will Smith, is currently streaming on Netflix right now in Canada, so go check it out. I'm pleased to welcome Storm Salter to the show. Storm, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, blessings and love. Thank you for having me. And bless up everybody else on the call. Yeah, excellent, excellent. And we also have someone else who's often described as the godfather of black British photography. His iconic images have captured the involving cultural landscape, social change, and stimulated debate in the United Kingdom over the past four years. He draws strength from remaining a humble man of the community whose personal character allows him to capture the intimate and private nature of people's everyday lives. He has exhibited widely in the United Kingdom and as far afield as New York, South Africa, China, and now uh, Canada with the uh, One Night Stirred at Sea exhibit at PAMA. We are pleased to welcome legendary photographer Photographer Vanley Burke. Vanley, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. But if I might correct you, it's not 40 years. It's more like 40 years. 40 years. Okay. <laughs> sorry. I, I, well, I said past four decades. <laughs> oh, the four, sorry. My apologies. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. But you know what? It's a, it's a storied career and I can't wait to talk to you about it. Okay. So let's actually start with how the exhibit is going so far. So, so Greg, obviously this year it's a bit different. I know there was huge plans to, to really make this uh, in a very immersive experience. But I must say, I, I believe you and Pama as well as Karen have done a fantastic job in, in really bringing this to life in this virtual format. So how is everything going so far? Uh, it's, it's been great. It's, I mean, as you said, other than the obvious that, that, that um, people aren't actually able to see the physical exhibition, um, 
we're glad that it's actually up on the wall. I think it makes a huge difference. And uh, Pema has done a lot to, to it's a virtual website. There is a, a virtual 360 tour that will be up on site uh, shortly, I believe. And of course, these virtual talks um, are, are adding to the, you know, uh, the ways in which people can join and, and actually get to see the work. Um, so we're quite, you know, we're quite pleased given, given everything. Exactly. And actually, I'm also curious because this exhibit, to me, being someone who grew up in Brampton, very much immersed in Peel, um, it, it's very much reflective of our community. And, and I'm curious, what is what has been the community feedback since it's opened up? From what I've heard, uh, the feedback has been amazing. Um, I think it's, it, as you said, I think it's one of the first exhibitions that's really been able to... Uh, what I've heard is, is the, the, the voices that I've heard have, have said that this is a, an exhibition that they've seen as one of the first that's been able to sort of tell their story. Uh, it really connects to a lot of people in the area. Um, and I think it's a, 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 an exhibition that, you know, there, sh there should be more of them. And, and they're, they're, you know, I'm surprised that there hasn't been more of them uh, already, more, you know, but it's, a, it's kind of a new, people are looking around now and starting to see different areas where art has always existed, but uh, exploring different ways of, of um, accessing it. So the the response, as, to the best of my knowledge, has been great. And as I said earlier, it's unfortunate that people can't get in to actually see the work. Um, but that's, you know, that's happening all over the place. That's global now. So exactly, exactly. And hopefully, uh, you know, as we sort of get through this, this next wave of a lockdown, as we head into 2021, because I know the exhibit's running till January, we'll be able to have people actually go and, 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 and experience it because it is from what I've seen, even just virtually it is phenomenal work and kudos to you and Karen and Pam for, for bringing it to the community. And, and, uh, I, you know, I'd love to talk to, to, to some of the people that are going to be involved right now in the, uh, virtual talk taking place next Saturday and storm. We'll begin with you. You are a filmmaker and visual artist that's worked with, like I mentioned earlier, a plethora of artists, including chronics arcade fire jay-z and beyonce for their on the run tour like you've done a lot and and it's truly fascinating to see uh just just your your resume of, of all the awesome stuff you've been able to do uh but i'm curious for anyone listening to this that's that's uh amazed by your by your resume i bet they're curious how did you get your start in the industry um you know it was a bit of a whirlwind um i actually you know i left jamaica when i was like 16 I had a sister, I have a, I have a sister who <laughs> moved to um, Los Angeles and um, I basically just need, I didn't have a plan or for college or anything, but I just needed to get out. I need to, you know, I, I was hitting my head on the ceiling and I was this very out there creative youth. And um, so I went and I eventually, you know, there was a film school there, the Los Angeles film school. I eventually decided, let me, let me just try that. You know, I was always into making art and I picked up some mentors along the way that definitely had an impact on my, my life. One of which is, um, director X, mm -hmm. you know, he, mm -hmm. he, actually, when I finished film school, I had met him when I, he was shooting something in Jamaica. He encouraged me to come to New York and I, and I, you know, figured it out. I got there. I directed second unit on some of his stuff. And he was like, and there's been a few mentors like that, that have kind of like, I found myself in interesting spaces, picking up certain skills, like, I was um, seeing how like the best music video directors were directing the videos and I was there shooting alongside them with their confidence when I was like, you know, 18 or something. So mm -hmm. I kind of picked up all these things along the way. And honestly, in between having to renew a visa <laughs> and just a certain place in my life, returning to Jamaica and being like, why am I going to go back to America and try to, you know, tell their story? Like when, there's this whole world of like this visual world to be kind of um, this discovered and, and, and to play in, in Jamaica. So, um, and the thing about Jamaica is I, I'm creating work from here and of here, but a lot of people pass through Jamaica. Jamaica is a vibes capital, you know what I mean? So a lot of these, like I met, you know, Wynne and Regine from Arcade Fire in Jamaica, mm. you know, at a party. <laughs> and we just had a good vibe. Yeah. And then um, I was in the Toronto for TIFF and I went and visited them right in, in Montreal. And then, you know, we were just friends and that led to us collaborating, you know, in work. So like it's, it's something is through friends, something, you know, but Jamaica has always been at the heart of it. So it's really because everybody comes here, you know, mm. so that's been a part of me, like the same link with 
you know, the underrun world tour, you know, they shot that in Jamaica. Yeah. So, you know, I was one of the people, creatives that they called on to be a part of that, capturing those visuals, you know, and, um, and obviously Jamaican art, Chronics, Protégé, Popcorn, I mean, all these artists are global. So, you know, I think creating in this space, it's powerful, you know, J Jamaica's impact in the art world. And I just think being situated here has probably given me the biggest opportunities, more than links, you know? Yeah, shout out to Director X, little Brampton boy right there. I got to meet him a few years ago. And um, no, I, honestly, he has a great eye for talent. And, and, and the work that you, you bring to the table, especially when I caught your movie Sprinter on Netflix, uh, you know, for someone like me that's only ever interacted with Jamaica from a tourist standpoint, I really just appreciated being able to be brought into the world of the people that actually live there versus getting clouded by you know, the, the resort vacation that I take with my wife, even, and we, we love just the Jamaican culture, especially when we get to venture out of the resort and actually really immerse ourselves in what, what actually makes uh, the place so wonderful. But I, but I really found that you touched on a, a lot of great themes in your film Sprinter, and I'm not going to give it away, but I do urge everyone to go check it out on Netflix. Um, but it's very much about the separation of families and, and the Jamaican experience. And I'm wondering what the pieces that you have involved with this exhibit um, does that come through and, and is this something that comes through in your work in general? Yeah, there, there are definitely certain themes that I find I'm drawn to over and over. Um, I mean, as a Caribbean man, I'm always, you know, trying to watch, look at myself and analyze certain things, you know, and we, you know, so I do find whether in my films or even in a lot of this photo, photo based work, these, these kind of stories is, about kind of you know because we have as you know jamaica and this but you know we have this amazing talent this, this this there's definitely like a hyper masculinity thing that is big part of the culture and 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 it and i'm just i'm i'm analyzing my own growth and i'm also just analyzing that around because it affects so much not only you know in, in so many ways mm. um so those are like things that move through and also immigration and that's what's interesting about like and that's what's interesting about sprinter too and even about this exhibition is the that you know the, the connection of families like families that are pulled apart and what that means for emotional connection or separation but also what that means about like how our stories travel mm -hmm. and that's what i'm excited about showing him there so that folks there can be inspired of the diaspora in particular can interact with the work because we are all a chain, you know what I mean? Exactly, so. exactly. Van Lee, you are considered the godfather of Black British photography, and similar to how, how Storm's been able to uh, bring to life his experience uh, being someone that lives in Jamaica and kind of showcase some of the things uh, that happen uh, in, in his home. Um, you've done a fantastic job across four decades and really... Um, epitomizing the Black British experience. And, and obviously you got to cover the Windrush era in the UK during the 70s and 80s. Uh, what did you get introduced to the camera? Well, mine was by way of, um, while I was still living in Jamaica, by way of one of the many parcels that were sent from families who were living in England. Mm. Um, we look forward to these parcels, which would arrive on birthdays and uh, Christmas, a uh, special occasion, and in one such parcel, I received a, a, a box brownie. Mm, well, nice. a brownie camera, yeah, um, yeah. 127. Wow. And then was, it, was that it? Was that the start? Yeah, well, that was my introduction to the camera. And um, you, you have to imagine I'm from St. Thomas, the foothills of Blue Mountain. So we are pretty rural. You know, mm. I described it as where, you know, when you ride a donkey and the donkey can't go anymore, if you get off and go around the corner, that's you might find where I live. Um, or perhaps even a little bit further. We are off the beaten track, basically. Mm. So imagine a young boy of 10 receiving a camera um you know in in, in, that, in that sort of environment and it was quite fascinating the, the the whole idea of recording you know what was in front of you i was quite intrigued by the, the the you know how the camera works you know the whole process how the image got from there to you know in, in the camera how do you capture the camera how do you retain it um it wasn't until i came to england really that my love for the artist the you know the developing the artistic side of the of of the the photographic process developed, and I made a conscious effort to start documenting um, the lives of and experience of African Caribbean. 
uh, as a young man living in Jamaica, what was happening, um, a lot of the, the people um, are, are from my village, for example, my district, were, were moving to England. Mm. And it was quite, I was quite curious. And as children, we would have several conversations about what life was really like in England. And so when I came here, um, part of the whole process that I developed for documenting uh, the, the, our, our, our experience here as thoroughly as possible was trying to answer some of the questions that we posed as children in Jamaica. And I continued, obviously, to develop those questions uh, even further, but I continued to try and answer those questions. Yeah, and the, do the documentary style of your photography is, is so captivating. And even just looking at some of your work over the last week, um, I was very much drawn to it. And, and it got me it got me to wonder, like, how would you describe your aesthetic? Like, how did you how were you able to find this style? And, and how have you made it work for yourself? Because again, some of your photos, I find that I can just stare at for for minutes, just kind of analyzing and kind of wondering, okay, well, what's, what's actually going through the minds of the people right now in this exact moment? And, and what are they going through? And, and what does this moment actually depict? And, and that's what, to me, has been some of my favorite uh, moments uh, from photographers is just being able to take a, a photo and being able to kind of really put your mind to it and really dissect it and figure out what the scene's about. Um, but how, how have you gone about creating your style and your aesthetic? Well, um, my, mine has primarily been the documentation, if you like. We, we, lived, we live in a society or much more prevalent than when I arrived in the 60s of uh, an environment which really, you know, didn't treat us well at all. And there were a lot of negative press about our, our experience, you know, about us being in England here. And I felt I needed to redress some of that because what I saw being written about uh, what what was being written about us in the press um, was not my experience of the life, and I felt that as a people we need to be uh, very much at the forefront of writing our own history. And for me, photography was one process that I would use to do that. I, I basically um, initially I, I, I was teaching myself. I went to evening classes and so on. I later went to the school of photography. It wasn't um, a, a, a photog it wasn't a documentary photography course. There were mainly commercial photographers, but um, my interest um, with developing with documenting the lives and experience of of, of, of people from the Caribbean um, had already developed, and I wanted to pursue that. I basically continued um, mm -hmm. just you know blazing my own trail. Really, um, the bo black body and framing that body within the geographical space for me has always been interesting and I think once you've sorted out your politics which um, for me played a very big part in the initial stages of my development um, you know everything tends to fall in place really um, I just pursue subjects um, given uh, loose headings for example when I started as I said there were no mentors so I would um, you know divide the project up into you know religion politics uh, education, formal and informal education, and so on. And as life went on, then and the complexity, of the community become became much more complex. Um, you know, um, then other new headings were formed, and so on. I, I, I basically, I'm not, I'm not too keen on following. I'm, I mean, I've been influenced by by several people. Obviously, I've seen their work and I admire their work. Um, I used to look through a lot of magazines and read a lot of books and so on. But for me, it has always been a sort of a single-minded approach to the documentation. And I never really tried to fit in a particular genre. I mean, I remember when I was told once that I was a social documentary photographer, I thought, wow, you know, and then I called myself a social documentary photographer and you know I, and when I became a um, you know something else or you know or someone said oh you're not a photographer you're an artist because you work in different medium I don't really have spend a lot of time identifying myself in any way shape or form I try to let the work do that awesome awesome and that's important right like if the the work can speak for itself then I guess you're doing your job <laughs> yeah I, I mean I, 
I, I, th I think by trying to fit within certain boxes that are defined, you know, as documentary, because you'll see there's some portraits and, and I've gone on to do much other work. And what I should say at this stage as well, perhaps, is that I, um, I felt that I was a, at a particularly unique position, really, to observe the arrival and uh, establishment of, of, of people from the Caribbean. And what I felt I would do is to... Um, you know, it was. It would have been about thirty or forty years since the first wind rush was sailed, um, and I thought, well, I wouldn't be able to photograph those people who came earlier. But my intention was to collect ephemera related to them, which has mm -hmm. resulted in me having uh, a considerable um, archive, which is housed at the Library of Birmingham at the moment. And we are currently looking for a space to house, you know, the library because I'm. I feel very much. Um, I, you know, I, I have a strong belief in us as a people being custodian of our own history and um that's that's what we're striving for at the moment yeah that's that's super important i think being able to uh maintain that history is, is crucial especially for future generations and it got me yeah. actually thinking about um this exhibit and, and the fact that uh and and greg you alluded to it earlier um regarding just the the feedback from the community but uh storm or vanley one of you just um, how important are exhibits like When Night Stirred at Sea, especially with everything that's going on in the world right now? And, and what impact do you think um, more exhibits like the one that we're talking about right now could have um, if we continue with this wave? And, and Storm, we'll begin with you. Um, I feel like, you know, just just even this whole virtual exhibit life, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's obviously essential because there's work and the work needs to be seen and we have to kind of like carve out the best ways to have these experiences. So, you know, in that way, it's very interesting to be a part of it. I hope that, you know, I hope, I hope it leads to the work being seen more, you know, and mm -hmm. being seen by more other people who should see it. You know, um, I do feel, you know, that, Main, like the diaspora, and it's, it's beyond just the diaspora, that's the thing. You know, the, but the diaspora initially, let's just say that, you know, it's very important, like I said before, for this to be this very solid link, for them to be getting inspired by the work that's here looking that way because there's work that they're doing looking the other way and just mm -hmm. strengthening those kind of creative conversations and inspirations. I think that's always super key. For me, as an artist, I'm very interested in that. I'm very interested in someone seeing something in the images that they may not have even experienced yet, but it's in their, you know, it's in their family kind of, you know, they know it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's that. And I mean, also, I will say this as well, like Vanley, I never got to say this before, but I'm really inspired by your photography. I'd seen it many times, you know, in different places. I actually didn't even realize it was your work until like this came around and then I was like, oh, wow, okay, you took that picture, you know? And I think it's cool to just be in the same space showing photography where your photography is as well. You know what I mean? Because, you know, it, the, the, I just feel like all the work has a relation and I would have been inspired by, you know, you know, your like, composition like I really love the composition in your photographs and I feel like that's what I am good at and that's where some of my good photos come from are random moments where I just capture a frame and something about how it hits is great and it's very instinctive mm -hmm. and I it feels like street photography in a way to me or it feels like on the cuff photography but somehow in the work kind of reduce it to this thing that feels more like you know larger iconic I don't know you know mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I mean, if I were to get a pound for every time someone tell me they like my work, I would be rich. <laughs> <laughs> rich in compliments, Vanley. Rich in compliments. I am extremely. <laughs> and in fact, and in fact, if I might say, that has been my currency for many a years because there was never really a, a financial reward from the work that I've been doing. So, what what has really spurred me on has been. 
um, if you like, comment from people when I go to the shop or when I go to an event and, you know, for example, I'll hear a, a, a woman will say to me, without the photographs I've taken, she wouldn't be able to talk to her children about her past and how important that is. You know, those are for me some of the, you know, the, the currency that has buoyed me. I, I If I might, um, I remember once I... You know, as artists, you go through these moments and, you know, just asking yourself, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? What's the value in it? So I asked myself those questions and came to the conclusion that, you know, this idea of a society that I, I, I claim that I've created, is it only in my head? Does it exist? Although the people are there. So I, I thought to myself, perhaps I should... Um, take out an ad in one of our newspapers, um, one of the black newspapers, and announce that I would burn in my negatives, for example, in Hansworth Park on a particular date and time just to see who would turn up or who would be bothered. And I remember mentioning this to, um, to uh, a young man in the park, and he says, but they're not yours to burn. Mm. And for me, that answered the question about, you know, the value and the importance of that for a community. And, um, you know, they get used a lot for books, magazines, for, you know, for book covers. In fact, well, I can't say that just now, but um, Steve McQueen is using one of the photograph in his film. But as you were talking wow. about that framing, for me, that is so important because, first of all, that's where you stop your viewer. You know, yeah. you, you, you allow them to pause and then you allow them to take in. And if the photograph um, that I'm most, is most popular from, from the ones I've taken is The Boy With Flag. Mm -hmm. And um, that was taken in Hansworth Park. I saw this young lad ride in his, park, his, his bike that he had made through the park with a flag attached to it. And I thought, wow, you know, he did... I, I, was he aware of the dynamics that was going on with this young black lad mm -hmm. and, and the British and the Union Jack riding through Hansworth? Because at the time, you see, we were struggling with identity and belonging. And um, so I thought this is a photograph, but I was quite, if you look at the photograph, you'll see the flag, um, the, 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 the middle of the flag, the horizon in the, the middle of the flag, the line in the middle, is set on the horizon in the background and also the line coming from the left is directly behind his head um so it's like everything focuses on him it brings it in and i was quite conscious of that um at the time you know you have fraction of a second really to pull these things together and obviously fortunately for me as well the wind blew at the right time other that otherwise that photograph wouldn't wouldn't have been made but that idea you know it's about practice practice and then you're able to see and feel you know what you want but i think first and foremost when i'm asked how would i advise younger people to to, to approach photography, I'd say get rid of your TV and <laughs> not so good for a filmmaker. Get rid of your TV and um, and just practice. Just keep doing it. Yeah, and that's actually, uh, uh, you know, that, that was a question I had here was regarding what advice you'd give to aspiring artists, not just Caribbean, but also other BIPOC artists because I, I, that's what I truly feel when I see an exhibit like this uh, in our community, in, in, in Peel, which is so diverse, is it definitely hits home and it definitely showcases that the talent that exists even in our community has an opportunity to to get their work displayed at an institution like PAMA. Storm, what, what advice would you give to anyone that's aspiring that wants to get their work out there and, and displayed like this? Um, Sorry, Gary. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Um, for me, what I did, you see, the environment here was never set up to appreciate or accommodate artists like myself. Mm. Um, so we struggled initially, but for me, that was never a problem. Um, what I did is I would take a box of photographs around with me and I would engage with the people I'm photographing. What I was doing is actually educating them in the process. Um, you find a lot of the people who came to England initially are rural people. And for them, a, a lot of them, the first time they've ever had their photograph taken was for their passport photograph. Mm. 
Wow. A lot of them are quite mistrustful as well of their artists and the perp and, and you know reason for taking these photographs. So I would walk with a box of photographs. I would ex exhibit photographs in, in pubs and clubs and church halls and wherever I, I have the opportunity really I would I would you know hang some photographs, but I would always have the photographs, you know, to show people. In fact, at some stage, I remember thinking mine was never really about showing the photograph. It was about taking the photograph. Um, it was about, you know, capturing these very important moments. Um, the taking and showing of the photo, the showing of the photograph is something really that came much later on, you know, but, um, you know, I'll just say do it, you, you know, just get them out there, really. I mean, what that did for me, build up a sort of um, a, 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 a base of supporters, if you like, or people who admire the work. And whenever I have exhibitions, you know, they're always really full. Um, and, you know, whenever I post something online, there's a lot of response to it because that audience, if you like, has been nurtured, you know, over many years. So they're, they're aware of, um, you know, the material that they get. In. Yeah, just keep reminding them. Storm, what about you? Um, I would say, you know, there's, there's many ways to go about it. I've seen people get out there because they post everything to Instagram and the work is just so good that the audience just builds. And that might be the most obvious approach for me from a, when I'm, especially with photography, because photography is kind of like my first love, you know, I mm -hmm. work in all kinds of mediums, but photography is what I felt I was really good at first. And that led to cinematography, which led to directing and yeah. I've, a writer um, is I'm wary of sharing the, my really prized images on any social media, like because I literally I have an image, right? It showed uh, it showed at the National Biennial in Jamaica um, some years ago, and it was kind of a racy image that I just shot randomly with this girl with this you know nude body with this um you know, M16, and it was a crazy backstory of how it all happened. <laughs> and, um, but it was a, it's a pretty cool picture, and it was mm -hmm. kind of like early, like, showing photography, so to speak. And um, basically, you know, I remember I put it on my website, you know, as one of the images on my website, and this girl who I knew basically took the image and put, like, she was doing some weird cleaning service. Oh, and, wow, like, wow. Yeah, details and posted it like got your attention da, 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 da. and of course you know it changes the whole context of the image because yeah. you know i'm not doing make a statement especially when there's nudity involved so to speak you know so it was so that taught me a real lesson and now it's like i have to look at the work like how i need to control how some of it gets seen mm -hmm. in a way it's like it's this thing between getting the images out there for maximum eyeballs or finding ways to kind of like preserve a conversation and, and present work in a way that says something very specific. I find a lot of the images I have, if I put them out there, they're just going to go because they might have some other, some element to them that's humorous or meme worthy or is some artist or something, you know what I mean? So, so I would say for me, you have to pick your battles, you know, mm. and, um, I think, you need to not give everything away. Don't give Instagram all your images. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I think if you want to show like the stuff that's on the walls at Palma, a lot of it has never been printed before. Wow. A lot of it has never been seen before. I think there's, I do still believe in that, like, you know, the value of that, like, you know, that gallery thing, like, you know, yeah, that, not that, you know, I don't know. There's something about the white walls and the work on the white walls and, me being inspired by seeing Basquiat stuff or mm -hmm. seeing artists that had that experience, you know, it's like, it's, it's still inspiring. The work hits me differently. So I think that people need to be tactical about how you drop your images. You know, you might have to put out a wicked one to get some attention and save some of the other ones. You know? Yeah. Cause to your point, once you post it on social media, it becomes public domain, right? Like it's just, yeah. It, it's, it, <laughs> if, 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 if I might, I mean, I, 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 quite a few photographs of mine have been scanned for the archive that I have, um, you know, and they, and they are out there. But one of the things I find which is slightly different um, um, is that um, I do love the gallery space as a means of expression. Um, mm. For me, you know, that's a wonderful space. But I also uh, um, 
like the internet because what the work does, it, they're like baits for me. Um, you know, they're out there and in my absence, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. And if you like every now and then, if you like, they pull in something, someone comes to me, you know, hey, I want to use this photograph for a book jacket. Can, can, can I, I would like to write about this photograph. I'm, I'm doing uh, my dissertation on X, Y, or Z, and these photographs get used. And, and in that way, the photograph gets, you know, is doing what it's supposed to be doing. I, I tend not to just take a photograph and put it on, 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 on Instagram. And whereas I might print the photographs, sometimes I won't necessarily um, do a fine print of it. So I can have photographs of you know, for several years and, and not seeing them. For example, the boy with the flag, there are a few other photographs I was thinking I need to release soon. And that's him actually on the bike, riding it with his dog running behind him. Mm. You know, th that, that's never been seen. Um, wow. But for me, the idea is just getting them out there. But interestingly, you were saying so that, um, you know, you were a photographer being a filmmaker, I I really was interested in making films. And I found it one of the hardest things to do. Um, I, I bought, I even, I went as far as to buy myself a, 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 a Bolex H16 um, film camera and I shot some stuff on it. But for me, I, I like the idea of the, 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 this lone person going out there. And I find with movies, it, it, it often includes a lot of people. And yeah. again, I like the idea of the fly on the wall. And perhaps I might, had I, you know, picked it up, been able to develop that idea. But what I don't like with the movie, um, and I admire, is um, for me it's difficult. Perhaps that's why I don't like it. Is this idea that you you might have to take twenty shots of the same thing? For me, life doesn't give me that opportunity to go over thing twenty times. So you really need to get it the first time. Mm -hmm. or even in the first series of shot as opposed to that and, and i'm struggling with that idea really which is why but i do love the the form of um you know movie in in, in terms of um using that as a medium very much yeah i mean i can i can definitely say that you know i feel there's a certain purity of just capturing the image like i find if i'm in especially when i'm when i feel like pure inspiration i must make art now the probably purest form of that is walking around and pictures, you know. Um, I actually have a cool little Leica digital camera that is amazing because I was like, I need some of the best stuff I'm capturing is literally just random, you know. Like when I, when Blackberry was what everybody had, I have some amazing images on Blackberry, but these pictures are so trash, you know. But you know. <laughs> Even in the in the work now, which you are combining images from, you know, some some of them are decades apart. It'll be like one image is literally an old BlackBerry, another one is a Canon or something, you know. And uh, that that I I've always I've like I strive to be able to just capture something in the moment that can hit the walls, you know. I guess that's why I need a new phone with a big ass camera because then mm -hmm. it'll be museum worthy. But that to me is the like most it's a pure form and I do always strive for like the simple impact of what a powerful photograph can do. I think even as you, as a filmmaker, the better you get is the more efficient you perform. Mm. So it's less takes you have to do. It's the knowing the thing without having to think about it. You know, you kind of, it's, it is a very busy art form, but mm. the, the masters of it are the ones who can move with like efficient simplicity and that's when you know you're getting good. So you're still yeah. striving to get back to the singular vision. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think we're all trying that. I mean, I, I try every day. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. I feel like we can keep this conversation going, but unfortunately we are kind of running out of time, but I was just, I was just enjoying it. I, I love, I love when people talk shop about their craft and, and really go deep into the process behind what they do. And, and it makes me want to go pick up a camera now. So <laughs> who knows? Maybe I might play around with my, my iPhone later and, and see what I can shoot in the moment. Um, I want to thank both of you for, for, for joining us as well as you, you as well, Greg, um, again, this exhibit is, is fantastic and, uh, I, we're very honored to, to be a, one of the partners for it as well. Um, with the artist talk, obviously coming up on November 28th, uh, Greg, what can we expect and what does the exhibit have planned as we close out the year? 
Well, the the artist talk on the 28th is the first of two, uh, and it's going to focus, as you've mentioned earlier, on the photographers in the show. There's four photographers in the show, um, obviously Storm and Benley. Uh, we also have Christina Leslie, who's a, a local artist, uh, mm-hmm. Durham region uh, from Pickering, um, and Janice Reed, who is from Brampton. So the four, they're the four main photographers in the exhibition. So each of them, uh, each of the artists will be speaking a little bit about their work. It'll be kind of a little bit, I'm hoping there's some more of that kind of um, interaction between artists, uh, conversations about their practice and how, how everybody got started and where they you know, what their influences are and what their connection is to the Caribbean. Um, we also have as part of that, that, uh, discussion on Saturday, next Saturday, there will be, um, there's a few commentators coming in, guest commentators, uh, to speak and, and uh, about the work and to the, to the artists themselves. So, uh, Paul Roth, who's the director of the Ryerson Image Center, uh, will be joining us. Uh, we hope, um, Marlene Smith, who is a British artist and curator, uh, Van Lee, you know her well, I think. And, um, Julie Crooks, um, who is now the, uh, curator of arts, uh, of global Africa and the diaspora at the AGO. Uh, will be joining us to speak as well. So it'll be a great uh, opportunity to get a little deeper dive into the artist's uh, practices and work. And then as far as the rest of the the season or the exhibition, I guess, or into the winter, um, that remains to be seen. There's a few sort of secret plans in the the works uh, to try to get some more exposure for uh, some of the artists specifically now that the the museum is unable to receive, you know, um, guests and visitors. So we're working on ways to get more of the visual, more of the art and the images out to the public. Um, I know we're, um, Pam is working hard on that and working with the, with the region um, to make, you know, just exploring ideas. And of course, there's another talk, which we'll deal with uh, and, and speak to the other artists in the show. And that's on January 28th. Um, so there's sort of continued virtual programming uh, as we move forward. We'll awesome. keep you posted. Yeah, definitely, definitely do. I think it's a fantastic exhibit and also I'm honored to to have you as well as Storm and, and Vanley joining us here on NTR. And and again, thank you everybody for for such an engaging conversation. That's One Night Stirred at Sea, uh, contemporary Caribbean art currently happening virtually right now with the Peel Art Gallery Museum and Archives. And do not miss uh, the first artist talk taking place virtually on November 28th, which features Storm, Vanley, as well as uh, Christina and Janice who were guests of NTR uh, a couple weeks ago. We just definitely enjoyed t- talking with them as well. We are going to take a quick commercial break here on New Theory Radio, and we're going to have more when we come back here on Saga 960 AM. You are listening to New Theory Radio. Welcome back to New Theory Radio here on Saga 960 AM, the show where we theorize on arts and pop culture. My name is Nav Danma and I am your host. New Theory Radio is presented by PAMA, the Peel Art Gallery Museum and Archives. And the sounds that you're hearing right now is that of my next guest. She is a singer and songwriter who was born in Newfoundland, but is currently based in Toronto. She's been writing hooks for most of her life, whether it was winning provincial music composition contests when she was a kid, to grinding it out in bars across Canada during her time in the award-winning band Rapper T, and to now hushing hundreds with a powerful, stark melody. She is certainly someone that needs to be on your radar. Her EP, A Thousand Ways, is set for release on November 27th, and her current single, Bomb, is making way and it's actually been in my head for the entire day. I am pleased to welcome Meg Warner to NTR. Meg, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. I got to get right into it because uh, honestly, your your journey through the bio that I was reading earlier is quite fascinating. But I want to go all the way back. Let's go back to the Atlantic. Um, how did you? How did your musical journey begin? 
Um, well, I am a Kiwanis Music Festival kid. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, and I, it depends on, like, I've, I've mentioned that sometimes uh, in conversation to people in Ontario, and not everybody knows what I'm talking about, so I don't know, like, how pervasive it is um, outside of uh, Atlantic Canada, at least. But in Newfoundland, it was huge, and I grew up in, you know, technically rural Newfoundland, even mm. though it's... Um, like the fourth or fifth biggest municipality in the province, but it's a small province. So, um, you know, it was like Kiwanis exists in a lot of these small communities. So I think like a lot of kids um, come up with that background. If they're drawn to music, a lot of times it's the only outlet. And um, that was the case for me. And then um, in junior high and high school, um, like people started forming bands and, did battle of bands and all that stuff. And I was definitely intrigued by it, but I didn't summon up the guts to do it until my last year. So um, most of my musical background, like in my childhood is um, classical. Mm, and nice. um, yeah, based in the Kiwanis Music Festival and the Royal Conservatory and all that. That's cool. That's cool. And that, that's like, it's kind of interesting how you, you've been able to take that background and also now shift it towards the style of music that you're currently doing right now. And as you were talking, I was thinking about when I was a kid and how whenever, whenever I turn on CBC, the, my only representation of Atlantic music would be like the Rankin family. Right. Or, or, uh, or I guess Rita McNeil, would she count as well? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And Just, like, you know, I think that that's like when people think of Newfoundland, especially um, a lot of times that is the music that they think of. And um you know, that music is awesome. And I love Celtic music. I love triad. I love folk. Um, and also Newfoundland has like a kind of a, like, I mean, I say surprisingly only because it seems that it, it's not that well known, but it has like a super diverse um, musical landscape. Like there's mm. all kinds of bands and it's like, I think I've heard it compared to Quebec sometimes in that mm -hmm. way. Like in Quebec, there's like, you know, people that are, famous and well-known kind of only in Quebec and Newfoundland is a little bit like that too. Like we have yeah. our own, um, you know, bands that like, you know, people go to shows as a pastime there. Right. So it's like, you can have people that are, um, kind of just known within that province and, and, um, yeah, it's like, it's a, it's a, I guess, yeah, surprisingly like musically diverse. Yeah, no, exactly. Exactly. And and it kind of begs my next question regarding uh, your your transition from going from Newfoundland to your point where uh, it is a tight knit community and there are uh, artists that are that are big within the, the Atlantic that aren't necessarily known uh, outside of uh, in other parts mm -hmm. of Canada to now eventually moving over to Toronto. Was that a bit of a, a culture shock for you? It definitely was. Um, at that point, I was on the road with my band a fair bit. So like we had spent a fair bit of time in Toronto. Um, my partner was living here um, and we were doing long distance. So it was like, you know, I definitely felt a pull to come here. And um, when I first moved here, it, it you know, Toronto's a magical city and I like wanted to move here for a while before I did. And I remember, you know, like kind of being in awe, <laughs> honest to God, for like the first two years that I was here. Every time I look at the CN Tower, I'd be like, that is the coolest building on the planet. <laughs> like it's like just like lights up the whole city. Like it's just, you know, I grew up in a town of like 12, 13,000 people. And then I moved to St. John's when I was 17 years old. And that was, you know, it like that was my experience of living in a city. And St. John's is, you know, 200,000 people or something like that. So that's a really small city. And moving to a place like this, like it just, you know, I grew up on much music and like, also just kind of being in the hub of what my like interpretation of what that world was and knowing that I was in a city, like I, the, the, um, the studio that we used to work out of was sleepless records, which is mm -hmm. right at uh, queen and Spadina. Mm -hmm. And I remember I was in there one day, just like, you know, writing a song or having a meeting or something. And like, 
chaos was there. And he was just like, you know, in the studio, like writing or recording. And I was like, my brain is going to fall out my butt. Like it was just like <laughs> such a crazy, that was like, you know, I think the biggest like shock of it was just kind of being in the thick of the music that I grew up listening to. And, and Toronto is like such a exciting city. Um, yeah. It, like broke my brain. It, it's always fascinating to, to hear uh, an, an outsider's perspective on Toronto. And, and the one thing I will mention is even being someone who, again, I'm, I'm from Brampton and Mississauga, but, um, you know, lived in Toronto and, and you honestly go to Toronto all the time because it's just what I do. Um, I, I still, I, I, I get you in that feeling of the CN Tower. Like I find that no matter what, if you're driving on the Gardener, uh, yeah. you know, if you're, if you're in the passenger seat, the go-to Instagram pic or the go-to oh, yeah. IG story is always the CN Tower. Like we yeah. take so much pride in that. Yeah. And I, and I think that feeling just never goes away. Absolutely. I think like I will forever stand by, like, I think that like the, most beautiful drive that I can think of in the country is when you first, there's two, when you first head west out of Calgary and you start to see the Rockies for the first time. And when you're driving down the Gardner in the middle of the city Mm -hmm. and you know, it's the CN tower and the Rogers center and you're in the, like, it's just like, it is one of the most beautiful views in the whole country. It's just Mm -hmm. like, yeah, you got harbor front to your right usually. Yeah, exactly. Where you're coming coming from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so no. beautiful. And it's, it's also quite interesting, yeah, it, 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 hearing your perspective because I think to a lot of people that aren't from Toronto, making it Toronto, making making it to Toronto, is, is definitely a huge deal. But then when you have a lot of Toronto artists based in Toronto, for them making it in the u.s is is yeah a, is the is the goal right yeah. and yeah. and i find that always to be a fascinating trade-off because then i feel at times that some people just don't truly appreciate what the city has to offer mm-hmm. and you almost have to see it through an outsider's perspective to really understand that yeah i can see that i like to me i guess um i i mean i guess that's kind of just like human that's a very human thing to do. Yeah. You know, like I <laughs> grew up in this small town and, and I looked at St. John's as the big city and then I moved to St. John's and lived there. And then I looked at Toronto as the big city. And like, I, I don't know if I will ever reach a point where I would want to like, you know, move to LA or whatever to kind of do the American thing. I mean, especially right now, it just feels like a nightmare. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I get that. Like, I think that that's just kind of a human thing to do is always, you know, if you, I would, I can only imagine that if you grow up in Toronto, it, it, it must not have the same sense of specialness as, as it does to someone like me who, um, you know, saw, like grew up with images of this city and didn't live here. Mm-hmm. So I get that. Yeah, totally. Totally. Another transition that you made recently is obviously you were part of, of, of Rapper T, which was, uh, uh, definitely a band that made a lot of noise, I would say, a few years ago. And, and you know, you, you opened for the likes of Weezer and OK Go, which was amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now you've transitioned into a solo artist. What's that been like and, and what drove that decision? Um, I mean, it was pretty complicated, but uh, I, I tend to kind of summarize it as I just was not doing very well. Mm-hmm. Um, I became pretty mentally ill towards the end of my time in repartee and was basically um like dysfunctionally depressed so I wasn't really able to work a lot and you know repartee was my life like I was I was very driven and ambitious and um for a long time it was kind of the singular focus of it and um I think that you know I mean it was a lot of different factors but like that was uh, certainly contributed to my mental illness. I didn't really have much of a balanced life mm-hmm. at that point. And um, that's kind of the, the, the short version. Um, and it <laughs> is very different being on my own. Um, I spent a long time, you know, co-writing and, and um, having a lot of, 
people to kind of get through. Like if I were to, to come up with an idea or like if me and my other bandmate would come up with an idea together, then it would have to, you know, we'd have to work it out through the band and with the band and then it'd have to go through like our management and then maybe even a record label. Like it was like, um, <laughs> like a three or four kind of tiered process sometimes. And not having that has been both, like incredibly liberating and also terrifying. Like it was a skill that I kind of had to relearn. I had to relearn how to like, you know, trust my own instinct. And honestly, I had to relearn like what I liked and what kind of um, songwriting, uh, like in terms of songwriting, like what kind of ideas I liked and what kind of direction I wanted to go in because I, a, I had all the freedom in the world mm -hmm. and B, I spent a long time being really collaborative. So, you know, it was a, it was a skill that I had to develop. Yeah. And it's always, it's always fascinating to, to hear the story behind someone that, that decides to, to break free, if you want to say that and, and mm -hmm. decide to go on their own path because the one thing that I've always heard when it comes to a band is you obviously have your, you know, a band to rely on when it comes to decisions that, that need to be made or even just having that, that, that camaraderie to yeah. push through together. Yeah. Um, now that you're solo, it's like, Hey, you're responsible for yourself in these major decisions. And, and, and there's, you know, again, you're, you're kind of in on this alone as much as you have yeah. a team around you, mm -hmm. it is you that's the centralized figure. So yeah, um, yeah. I, I found that very, very unique as I was kind of looking into, into, into the work that you're putting into to your new EP, which is a great segue to, to my next question. Um, your, your new EP drops November 27th. It is called a thousand ways. Tell me more about that. Um, well, it's funny, you know, coming out of the band, like I just mentioned, like I, you know, it was the singular focus of my life and, um, Leaving the band was really difficult and that that time period was really painful and I think that I learned a lot about myself and I learned a lot about um, being in the music industry and what that means and and um, you know I think I was very green about it all mm -hmm. um, when I certainly when I came into the band, like repartee was my first band basically. So I really didn't know what I was doing at, like at the very beginning, but even as we worked through it and I was, you know, um, very involved in, in the industry. Um, I don't think I quite realized how, um, unhealthy a lot of it was for me. And when I left, I realized that, you know, like there are, certain like personality types and certain people that really do well in that kind of environment where, you know, uh, like I, I really felt, I guess pressured is the right word. I don't really know what the right word is, but like, I, I felt like I didn't have much of an option except to work at it as a singular focus. Mm -hmm. And this was kind of a decision that we had all made collectively as a band, you know, like we all moved to Toronto and did all that stuff. So like stakes were very high. And when I left, I was like, you know, there were a lot of that that really didn't work for me. And I, I want to develop friendships. And I remember like I had someone in the industry call me lazy because I had um, spent a Friday night with my partner. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, I don't wow. know, you know, like... I get, I, and you know, like the, the kind of hustle and grind kind of thing. Like, again, I'm not saying that like it doesn't work for everybody, but it, it definitely did not work for me. And it kind of left me in a really unhealthy place. So anyway, I, I was just thinking like this was maybe a year or two after I'd left the band and I was like, you know, I, I know what I want. I want to be happy and I want to make a living. <laughs> so I was like, okay, those are the two things that I would like. And, you know, I was like, if I, if those are the, the two points that drive me, then everything else, I'll, I'll figure it out. Like I'll yeah. find a, I'll find a way to have a career in music somehow. Like as long as I'm just 
feeling good and I'm feeling happy. So that's kind of where the idea of a thousand ways came out. And, and, you know, the, there's a song on the EP um, that's called that. And then the EP is named that as well. Cause it, it's just this idea of like, maybe there's not just one way to exist in the music industry or just, you know, kind of in life in general, I, I think sometimes we pigeonhole ourselves or we get pigeonholed and then it's hard to like, you feel pressure to do things a certain way or to exist in a certain way. And, you know, it is a little bit of an experiment. This is my experimentation in trying to exist in the industry as I want to, but I just like, I, I'll, you know, I just had this moment where I was like, I would rather like, you know, go back to school and become a teacher or something than exist in the industry the way that I was before. It just yeah. was not working. So, you know, I think there's a bunch of different ways to, to get to a place where I'm happy and I'm making a living. And that's kind of it. It really feels like that with this release, you really did it on your own terms. That's definitely what I was trying to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, and I, you know, I still kind of like face decisions like that every day where, you know, I get up and, and this is a hard time for everybody, you know, like the pandemic is, is really, really difficult. And, um, you know, my partner and I are both away from our families and, um, my brother lives in BC and just had a baby in May and I don't know when I'm going to meet that baby. You know, it's like all mm. kinds of difficult things. Yeah. And sometimes I need to remind myself that like, <laughs> like I'm doing the best that I can with this release stuff. And so, you know, if I don't spend three hours today researching blogs, like that's kind of, that's okay. You mm -hmm. know, like that's, I'm trying to go easy on myself with that. And I think in that way, I'm, I'm, you know, just trying to exist here with much less uh, desperation than I was yeah. before. Yeah, honestly, good for you. Because I, I think Thank there's you. a lot of there's always a lot of pressure, right? Especially now with the impact of the pandemic. I think a lot of artists that I've been able to speak to, whether it be in music, whether it be in uh, in, in in visual art, whether it be uh, even just in in media arts, it's there's just a lot of uncertainty, and and yeah. that can add to the pressure of wanting to get noticed and finding ways to get noticed and really burning a lot of energy. And yeah. you're driving yourself crazy to the yeah. point where you're like, I don't know what to do anymore. So mm -hmm. I, I, I'm, it's refreshing to hear your perspective on, on removing that pressure and, and I guess applying it when it's necessary, but being able to tell yourself, Hey, look, um, today I can chill out because I, yeah. I, I know for a fact I'm not in the right headspace and, and maybe mm -hmm. I need to go at this again tomorrow. Yeah. And I, I appreciate you saying that. And I also recognize that like, you know, I am coming from a place of privilege when I say that, like, I don't know what's going to happen because I also was bartending and I was laid off. Right. So mm. it's like, I don't know what's going to happen when the CRV runs out. I don't know. You know, like I'm kind of existing as a lot of artists now with, you know, financial assistance. So mm -hmm. that being said, I mean, like that also contributes a lot to this, you know, grind because it's like a lot of times we're just, trying to make a living it's a very difficult industry to make a living in and that's also kind of why i became a little bit more um serious about the production and engineering side because i was like this is like you know if i'm going to exist in the music industry as i want to i need to accept that that will likely mean that i you know, probably won't have the same level of success that I had with repartee. And what does that mean financially? And how can I exist in the industry in a way that, um, you know, I can still be an artist and I still have the freedom to do what I want, but I also am making an income and, and making a living. So that definitely contributed to my decision to learn more about production and engineering too. That's actually a, a great transition to my next question. And that is this work that you've begun as a producer and engineer. Why do you think there's been such a lack of female representation in these types of positions? And 
Um, how would you like to see that change in the future? Because I know, uh, based on my my research of you, I know you are someone that's very vocal on equality and 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 really standing up for people's rights and and, and make, in, ensuring that any type of injustice is, has been. Uh, has been dealt with. And, and uh, I, th- I think it's fantastic that you decided to uh, enter into the world of producing and engineering because you don't hear about a lot of females in that space, right? Yeah. And, and even being a fan of just hip hop music, um, it's, it's like outside of Wonder Girl, like there isn't a lot of emphasis put on female producers as much as I think a lot of us would like to see. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. And I am like, I, re- I love that you're asking me this question. To be honest, I've, I've, you know, done a series of interviews for this EP and that question has not been asked to me yet. And I'm kind of surprised because I do talk a fair bit about it. Um, like, I guess not, maybe not as much in my bio, but like on social media and stuff, like I, this is something that is really important to me because it's, <laughs> it is like, abysmal it's it's awful the numbers are are just so incredibly unequal and like i do see it changing um i've i've noticed a change even in the past like two years there's been it seems like um a bit of a like an emergence of a lot of like female and non-binary femme producers and engineers um, which has been really wonderful. I do worry sometimes that that kind of community doesn't exist as much in smaller centers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I do feel very fortunate to be in Toronto right now when that is happening. And there are a lot of women and non-binary people that are peers and mentors that I like, I have like a circle of friends that I can send mixes off to and they'll give me feedback and vice versa, you know, like that is incredibly important. Um, I think to answer your question about why that is, I mean, I think it's complicated. You know, it does, there's a history of women and non-binary folk being excluded from technical fields in general. Um, I know in my own experience, which is the only experience I can speak to, um, I definitely felt incredibly left out. And mm-hmm. like, honestly, it was up until I started working on my own. Like I, I have felt um, sexism, mostly covert, like my entire career. And it was the reason why I didn't start a band until I was in grade 12. It's the reason why I didn't really start playing guitar until a couple years ago. It's the reason why I didn't feel comfortable getting into production. Cause I just, I like, I just felt you know, not in any real overt way, but it like that world wasn't for me. Like it Mm -hmm. wasn't welcoming for me. And also it is, you know, I always had this mental block that of like, well, I don't really know that much about the software. I'm not really a technical person. So, you know, that world isn't for me or whatever. But the more I got into it, the more I realized that like the technical side is, is, um, in a lot of ways, kind of the easiest thing to learn. It's the other, like the creative side, that's a little bit harder to learn. So I'm very lucky that I have these years of experience in the studio and writing and working with other people that I feel like now getting into production and engineering as late as I am, which is not that late. You know, I was probably 30 when I started picking up, picking it up seriously. Um, I do have like, you know, this years, these years of experience in my back pocket that I'm, has, have been really helpful. Um, but I mean, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a difficult world. And Mm -hmm. I think sometimes I feel like I'm in this beautiful little bubble here in Toronto sometimes. And, and when I leave, I'm reminded of how exclusive and brutal the, the industry can be. Um, and not that it isn't here, but yeah, it's, I don't know. I know that's a long winded answer to your question. No, no, no. I, I appreciate you asking it. Cause I, I, um, it is something that obviously there's a, there's a gap, there's a, a void and it, it, it needs to be filled and it is being filled. 
um, I definitely noticed changes, but uh, yeah, I think it's a complex issue. Yeah. And I hope more, more female femme non-binary uh, individuals follow your lead because I think representation in this industry needs to be called out at every single position, right? Like I think nowadays it's, it's very easy to, to turn a, turn a blind eye to some of these things because mm-hmm. you're just used to seeing things in a certain way. Yeah. But I think it's, I think it's fantastic that you decide to, to transition and it doesn't sound like, uh, you know, in, in any way, it doesn't sound like you did it because you are female and you wanted to do it. It sounds like there's a passion there, which is great, mm-hmm. but I just hope more people who have a passion for this are able to do the exact same thing and, and just triumph as much as you have. And another triumph is actually your first single off of a thousand ways bomb, which I mentioned earlier has been in my head the entire day, <laughs> such a powerful track. Um, I think before we started recording, I told you I'm getting, I get like Fiona Apple vice vibes from it. And I think it's, I think it's a heavy track. Um, and it has to do with the painful part of your past. So um, just to kind of round out this interview, um, what was it like putting this track together? Um, well, um, uh, like I mentioned, um, in, you know, 2016, 2017, as I was leaving the band, I was really unwell and, um, I've been writing music for a long time in my life. Um, songwriting is relatively new to me. I kind of really only got into it when I started Reverty. Um, but I never, when I got sick, I started using songwriting pretty well exclusively as like a coping mechanism Mm -hmm. and it became really cathartic and um excuse me this thing like you know i i wasn't really doing much at the time like i really wasn't very functional so having this um writing songs and writing music was incredibly helpful because it was like you know i wouldn't do a lot all day, but I could sit down and write a song and, you know, one minute have nothing and then write a song and then you have something and you've completed a task. And, you know, like that alone was really helpful, but also being able to talk uh, openly and kind of like being vulnerable in a way that I felt like I couldn't really do um, in any other way except writing music and in my lyrics, that was so helpful. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I was writing bomb, I was literally here in this studio, there's a little keyboard over there and I was like, just kind of fooling around on the keyboard and, and, um, I got this notification on my phone and it just sent me into this spiral, this like, you know, rumination, panic, shame, anxiety, guilt, whatever, Um, and at that time I was having like a lot of days like that. So, um, that feeling was just, I was just in the thick of it and, um, bomb came out of one session like that. And it just, you know, when those songs come out that way, it's rare. And I was just, um, I was just really happy to have something lovely come out of something that was really painful (laughs) um just one like quick little nerdy anecdote it's because it was written on a piano it um is written in b flat major which is like a totally fine key for playing piano but is a little bit trickier on guitar Mm -hmm. so um it was around the time that I was like learning bar chords. <laughs> so I was like, cause I was like, I'll just like, you know, transfer it up a key or something. Cause I wanted to play it on guitar. Yeah. But then I figured out that like, you can play anything on bar chords. So it was fine. That's um, awesome. Yeah. I just thought that was like, I still get those. Like I, like I grew up playing piano and keyboard. So I'm much more um, like adept, I guess is the word. Like I just, I, I, Keyboard makes sense to me. I don't know. Are you a guitar player? I'm not. I don't play any instruments, but oh, okay. <laughs> but the guitar is like a totally. It's all based on patterns. Like it, it does me, feel like, very intimidating for someone that has, yeah. that's never played. Yeah, the strings just don't make any sense. The keyboard is all laid out there in front of you. Anyway, um, 
Yeah, I just felt like that was kind of an interesting thing to actually just like take a song that was so clearly written around the piano and um, put it on all of these different instruments. Um, yeah, it was a it was a fun exercise. Yeah, I, I really dig the video too. The video, thank is, you. It's it's really cool, and um, yeah, I urge everybody to go check it out. Bomb, which is the uh, lead single off of your EP, A Thousand Ways, which comes out on November twenty seventh. What's next? Well, my next goal is to record and produce and mix my own EP. Nice. Um, yeah, and I worked on this EP with this incredible producer based in Halifax named Dan Ledwell. And he is an old friend and a very, very gifted producer. And before I worked with him, we kind of um, worked out this idea where he would teach me um, like production and engineering techniques while we were recording my own EP together. So um I learned so much from him and I definitely like, that's my next goal is to do all of it on my own. Well, when you do that, give us a show. We'd love to have you back on NTR. Meg, this was a really awesome chat. And I do thank you for making the time. And again, best of luck with the EP release. Uh, like I said, bomb is a fire track. So I, I urge everybody to go check it out and to go check out your EP, which comes out on November 27th. If anybody wants to connect with Meg Warren, what's the best way? Um, probably my Instagram or I also do like an old fashioned blog on my website. Oh, nice. Yeah. So I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm all over the place except Facebook. I don't have Facebook. Is it at, is it at Meg Warren? Yeah. At, at Meg Warren music. Awesome. For awesome. everything. So yeah. we'll, we'll definitely include that in our podcast description. That's Meg Warren. And yes, her album, A Thousand Ways, uh, the EP comes out on November 27th. So thank you, Meg, for joining us here at NTR. We are going to take a quick commercial break. And then when we come back, we're going to have more New Theory Radio on News Talk, the Saga, 960 AM. You are listening to New Theory Radio. Welcome back to New Theory Radio, the show we theorize on arts and pop culture. My name is Nab Danwen. I am your host. You are tuned in to News Talk Saga 960 AM and New Theory Radio is presented by PAMA, the Peel Art Gallery, Museum and Archives. And before we conclude this week's edition, I do want to let all of you know that next Saturday, November 28th at 7.30 p.m., New Theory Radio in conjunction with the Rose Theaters, this is Brampton Live Online series, is presenting its very first curated show as a part of the series and it is New Theory Radio Live, theories on songwriting as we discuss the inspiration, process, and performance aspects that are put into putting a song together. And I'm going to be joined by two amazing individuals, uh, one by the name of Arlene, who is a fantastic singer and songwriter from Mississauga, and the other is Raz, who is an amazing MC who's based here locally as well. And uh, we are going to get deep, and we're not only going to have a discussion on songwriting, but both Raz and Arlene will be performing as well. So you do not want to miss it. For more details, visit tickets.brampton.ca. We are right on the front page. You can get your free tickets by just simply going to that website. And again, this is a live stream show, and look out for more details coming throughout the week across our social media. And speaking of our social media, if you want to connect with New Theory Radio, it is at New Theory Radio on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you want to connect with me, it is at NabNanwa on Twitter. 
and Instagram. Big shouts to my little brother, Amit Nanma, aka at Colorblind Photography underscore for doing all of our graphics and photography. And special thanks to Dusty Loops, the wizard behind the beats. He is the man responsible for our theme song, as well as some of the other songs you heard throughout this episode. So go give him a follow at Dusty Loops across all social platforms. This is a wrap for this week's edition. Thank you so much for tuning in. Big thank you to all the guests that we had on. And uh, yes, you will hear us all next week, not only with a brand new episode, but with the new Theory Radio live show in conjunction with the Rose Theater. So do not miss it. Thank you so much. That's a wrap. And you will hear all of us next time. Peace. Present you is burnt out at your current job. But future you works at Geico. And future you is also a beekeeper. Me? I don't even go outside. Well, with Geico, you got a consistent schedule. So you are now one with nature, my friend. So I've become a bee person? Technically an apiarist. And yes, you also got a competitive salary, so you had the funds to start a new hobby. All right. Give me that honey. (laughs) Virginia Beach. Start your future at Geico. We're hiring claim sales and service agents. Apply online today at geico.job slash Virginia Beach. Present you is burnt out at your current job. But future you works at Geico. And future you is also a beekeeper. Me? I don't even go outside. Well, with Geico, you got a consistent schedule. So you are now one with nature, my friend. So I've become a bee person? Technically an apiarist. And yes, you also got a competitive salary, so you had the funds to start a new hobby. All right. Give me that honey. (laughs) Virginia Beach. Start your future at Geico. We're hiring claim sales and service agents. Apply online today at geico.job slash Virginia Beach.